that's a great segue though to lead into the next uh, the next line of questioning are you down are you down <laughs> okay uh, so I, I think it was that that interview that you had with Krivda where we had a little interaction in, in the comments there and I asked you about some principles that you might use to to decide on a reading that might be different in various TR editions how do you define what a TR edition is and are there certain editions of the TR that you wouldn't use for these four principles well you know I did a blog post mm-hmm. and then I did a word magazine podcast it was word, word magazine 140 back in 2019, responding to the witch TR objection. Really, my article and the podcast was a response to Dirk Yonkin. And I had I had read his introduction to the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. I had written a review of it that appeared, I think that was in the Puritan Reform Journal. And I disagree with Dirk Yonkin, but I do I do appreciate the fact that he takes the TR position somewhat seriously and has attempted to respond to it, even if it's in a negative way. Anyways, so he pointed to three passages in the New Testament at where there are, you know, differences between the printed editions of the TR. Yep. And so yep. I was, you know, I appreciated the challenge and I appreciated the opportunity to think through a little bit. And I suggested in that article, again, it was three years ago that I wrote it. So, you know, mm-hmm. and I might, I might, you know, say some things a little bit differently now, but maybe sure. not. Any, but I said four principles. So what do you do when you come to a place where there where there where there are two readings in the in the TR tradition? I said, first of all, you compare the printed Greek editions of the TR. You, mm-hmm. you compare and consult them and identify what's the problem, what's the issue, what's the difference. Then secondly, I said, the next thing would be to look at the early Protestant vernacular translations that were based on the printed edition. And then thirdly, if it's available, look at the annotations. Uh, that were you know there by the editors of those printed editions because uh, a lot of times they refer to the these differences within their annotation showing right. that they're they're aware of them and then look at you know look at commentaries do all that the fourth the fourth point that I um, suggested was with regard to minor variations like the one I mentioned in Matthew one eight look at the spelling look at, look for things that are issues of word order whether it has a definite article or not, whether a word is broken into two words or, or if, if it's put together as a compound word, something mm-hmm. like that, that might be a difference in the print editions of TR, but it has absolutely no effect on the meaning. It's the way the words are organized on the page. And, you know, in some cases, they're typos. So anyways, you could look for those things and you could dismiss a lot of these so-called differences as basically having no significant impact on determining what I would call the conceptual meaning of the reading. Then in that article, I applied that to the passages he suggested, which were Revelation 7, 7, Revelation 8, 11, and 2 mm-hmm. Peter 1, 1. So you were asking me about, okay, what do I mean by uh, print editions of the yes. TR? So with respect to that, in that article, I wrote the following. I said, quote, the editions, which should be primarily consulted, are the classic Protestant ones of Stephanus and Beza based on Erasmus's foundational work. Okay. The Elsevier editions should be consulted, but with the understanding that they appeared after most of the translations of the TR had been made into the modern languages of Europe. Basically, in the end, it's, it's a focus on, I think, the editions of Stephanus and Beza. I would draw a distinction uh, between the foundational work of Erasmus's early editions and other early printed editions of the Greek New Testament and what I've called the mature Protestant editions, printed editions of the TR. The first two editions of Erasmus, for example, 1516 and 1519, did not include the Coma Ioanneum, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Clearly, it becomes a consensus in Protestant Christianity that 1 John 5, 7, and 8 are authentic. Right, They're used, right. to, that, that passage is used as a proof text in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 2 on the doctrine mm-hmm. of God and the doctrine of the Trinity. So clearly there's a consensus. And so for that reason, the, the first and, and second editions of Erasmus's TR, although they were foundational, they're not complete. There's a, there's a process that's going on. Again, 
there's a process of recognition. There's a process of discernment. There's a process of gaining a consensus. And this really only comes to full flower, we could say, with the mature Protestant editions of the TR. Now, I want to be clear about something. I'm not saying the Bible changed. I'm not saying the Bible changed from the 1516 edition of Arras, right, right. You know, the 1550 of Stephanos and 1598 of Beza. The Bible did not change. The Bible mm -hmm. remained the same. God's word uh, remained the same, but there was a process among men for discovering it. Right. And, and so we got to be clear about that. So all that to be said, we're talking about the mature Protestant editions of the TR, which hold the most weight. So Mark Ward in his article talks about there having been 28 printed editions mm -hmm. of the TR. That's just patently untrue. And I know he did it for rhetorical purposes. He was trying to draw a parallel between, between the, the and Nestle Elon. Yep. Yep. But historically, it's just inaccurate. It's factually inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, you know, again, I'm, I'm speaking for myself and there are people yeah. who hold to the TR position who may have a different viewpoint on it. I'm sure that there are some, there are some who do, but from my my perspective, when we're talking about the mature Protestant printed editions of the TR, we're really talking about the four editions of Stephanus, mm -hmm. 1546, 1549, 1550, 1551. And we're talking about the five editions of Beza that were completed in his lifetime, 1560, 1565, 1582, 1589, and 1598. So that's really what we're talking about. Those are the mature printed editions of the TR. And we can also look at the foundational work of Erasmus, and we can look at the right. other early printed Greek editions, and those can be helpful for, for our understanding. But um, again, I would, I would look at those mature Protestant editions. But just think about this. Mm -hmm. The term textus receptus as a, as, a, as a reference to the traditional text was not even coined until, until yeah. 1633. Much later. Elsevier's second yeah. edition. So, so it would be anachronistic. To, we could say to some degree, it's anachronistic to call anything before 1633. Right, right. A Texas, Texas receptus. receptus. Because the term just begins to be used. But of course, we're using it. We can use it, you know, referring back in hindsight. So anyways, that's a, that's a long response to your question. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So in my mind, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that which TR question again. And uh, I'll, I'm just going to deviate just a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to represent your position. So what I want to do with the which TR is, is for some reason, there's, there appears to be a disconnect um, between between confessional bibliologists and critical text um, people, and, and even myself, I, I wouldn't be in, in, in more. We seem to have a disconnect here uh, when it comes to the question of, of which TR. So you mentioned, for example, uh, that the which TR, um, you, you use a Latin phrase. Sorry, I'm not as smart as you. <laughs> uh, uh, that it was uh, typically an argument used to bring doubt on the question. But I, I did a video a little while ago where I said, you know, that the which TR question was the biggest issue with confessional bibliology. I don't know if you had a chance to see that. The which TR question seems to come from like a maybe a misunderstanding of how of how confessional bibliology works. But I think if we if we tie in a couple facts, and again, this this is my understanding and probably how others have understood, it, and I think this is probably the reason for the disconnect, is we talk about jots and tittles, um, we talk about kept pure in all ages, seems to suggest, and this is where that per perceived inconsistency is, seems to suggest that there would be an addition or some sort sort of reference to the text that is in the TR, uh, which you would call the, the original text. But we typically don't see that. But did, did you hear did you hear what I said earlier, Dwayne? And that is the question really should not be which TR. The mm -hmm. question should be which Bible. Dwayne, I would ask you, do you believe that God has preserved his word? Do you believe God has preserved the scripture? And do you believe God has preserved the very words of scripture? What do you think? I would say... I, I'm still working this out. This is why I kind of hold like a, a Byzantine position, but it's certainly to me. And again, when I say to me, right, that that's putting the authority in the wrong place. I recognize that. But to me, mm -hmm. it seems unlikely that God would write his word for us and then break it up into pieces and have us go and find all the pieces and put it back together and see if maybe some of our, our uh, processes or some of our principles would work. I know that's the biggest issue I have with the critical text position is that, yeah, we've got these principles and they sound really 
nice on, on the face of it. But is there any testing involved in that principles? Or, or is there any way we can test and know that these principles are actually working? And given how now uh, CBGM is on the market, it seems that's a wholesale no, well, the previous stuff didn't work. So here's a new uh, set of policies and procedures we're going to try and run on the text. So I, I take issue with that, right? And and I, I think I've said that to just about everybody you've had on the channel. It leaves me in a position where finding God's word is is not found, you know, word for word in the critical text. But, you know, they would never claim they would never claim that. No, uh, and they don't. Right. They don't claim that they they don't claim that, that they have the Bible, basically. Yeah. What they, yeah. What they would say at the best, I mean, the, the evangelicals who've embraced modern church criticism would say at the best, we have a close approximation. to Right. It. Right. We almost have it. That would be the sort of thing you would hear. 